It's a real treat to be able to welcome back John. This is your third visit with us. Yeah, we are really privileged to have John with us. John has moved relatively locally after serving 25 years in the East Midlands, most recently in Leicester. Uh, for how many years were you in Leicester? 14 years. 14 years. years. Uh, and John has a wealth of wisdom uh, on a number of areas that we've been learning from. Uh, church planting, uh, planted three, three churches out of Leicester. Uh, and now has a wider role within the uh, Church of England particularly, but wider than that, uh, with Myriad, which is uh, an organization seeking to encourage thousands of new church plants uh, or worshipping communities, which are particularly lay-led, yep, rather than right. an ordained leader, uh, someone who is uh, lay-led in the church. And so John has that vision. And uh, John has also uh, got a real uh, prophetic voice, I believe, to share what's happening in the life of the church and in our culture uh, and at the New Wine Leaders Conference recently, we heard John speak uh, on a very similar talk. I've asked him to share here about looking where the church has come from and where it's going. And it's based on this book, really, The Church of Tomorrow, which, if you've not got a, got a copy, is the Big Church Read, Big Church New Wine Read and others. Uh, and some of you bought it last week. There's lots of copies on the bookstore. I really encourage you to get hold of this. Uh, John, uh, I pray, will be a great encouragement to us Probably also a bit challenging as well, uh, but that is always a good thing. Yeah. So can we pray for you, John? Thank you. Please as you do. speak to us. Father, thank you for John. Thank you for his wisdom, for his gifting, and for his experience, all those things that you have put in him. And I pray now for a fresh anointing of your spirit that we may hear and receive what you have for us today. Give us ears to hear, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, it is a joy to be here. It's always a joy to be invited back a number of times, which my wife was very surprised about when I told her about that. Um, and I've just been blessed this morning. Um, the worship and just the encouragement to come into God's presence, the intercessions, praying with real faith that God answers prayer. Uh, this is such a good community. And the encouragement about the missional communities is is something that's just on my heart. It's exactly what I really believe, that, that God has got a call on your life that, to use you to see his kingdom come and to impact people's lives. And that's done through you coming together with other people on mission together. Uh, and that's what Myriad is doing, whatever language we use, whether it's church planting or missional communities. Um, so I'm so encouraged to hear how you're stepping into this. So um, if we have the first slide, we're looking, as Simon said, at, at where, that, that, sorry, that's the myriad bit, the second slide, where we've come from and where we're going. And what I think God has done as he led me to, to write this book, The Church of Tomorrow, which I think is the thing that, that it helps people with, is just to help understand where we are today in this moment in church history and in our lives today is really affected by where we've come from. And because of where we come from, it helps us then to understand something of where we're going to. And I hope that that might be helpful. I'm going to do a little bit of that journey for you today. And if you read the book, then um, that's certainly what people are saying as helping them. But before we, um, we get into that journey, as it were, uh, I want to just reflect on the passage that we had read to us earlier. And if you read the, the letters from Jesus to the churches in, in Revelation in, the first, in chapters 2 and 3, it gives you a little insight on how Jesus speaks to his church. And it is passionate. It is absolutely passionately revealing the love of God for his church. But within that, that means there are some real ouch moments of challenge because the Father rebukes and disciplines those he loves, as well as real challenge to believe the truth of who Jesus is and his victory and all that he has won for us. So just a few reflections on that chapter that we'll base this journey on this morning. The first thing that we take from this passage is, as Jesus speaks to the church of Laodicea is that it is possible for a church to exclude Jesus from it. When you look at this, you discover Jesus is on the outside. He's knocking at the door. He's saying to this church, please, would you let me in? It's sobering, isn't it, to imagine being a church that has, let, has, has excluded Jesus. 
And of course, we would say, we haven't done that at all, Lord. We wouldn't do that to you. And yet, this is a church who doesn't think that they've done that. Because we discover in this passage that they think that they're doing really well. They think that they're rich and that they're strong and things are going fantastically well as a church. And yet Jesus says to them that they're wretched and pitiful and poor and naked and blind. And we're going to pick up that blind word as we go forward. One of the analogies he uses just to help them to understand what's happened is this idea of being lukewarm. And Jesus says, because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm literally going to vomit you out of my mouth. This is the moment in their history where Jesus says, this is a church-spitting moment. This is a moment where I'm going to reject you if you do not make a change, he says to this church. It's sobering. Now, we sometimes misunderstand this passage because we think, oh, why does Jesus want a church to be cold? Um, we understand hot maybe is an analogy, but in this part of the world where, where Laodicea is, it's in modern-day Turkey, and you get both the, um, the, the hot springs, uh, and you can go and bathe in the hot springs there, and then you also get the cold mountain waters that come down from the, uh, from the mountains as the ice caps melt. And Jesus is saying, you know that when water is hot or cold, it's refreshing, it gives life, it brings joy, and, we, and you love to use it in those forms. But you know what it's like when water becomes tepid and you drink it in a hot climate and you go, oh, that's just, it's, and I, you want to get it out of your mouth. And he's saying, Church of Laodicea, that is what you have done and that is the effect you have on me. It's sobering, friends. But Jesus, in his passionate love for the church, is giving them a, a way forward. And he says, if you will repent, if you will change your mind, if you'll turn away from this way and you'll open the door to me, then I will come in and I'll eat with you and we'll restore relationship and we'll go on to, to discover how you can know my victory and, and all that you're called to and meant to be. And so this is a message of hope, but it comes with a challenging reality check for this church that their perception of who they are and how they are is so distorted that Jesus has to speak so strongly to them. So I just want you to turn to your neighbor and say, don't worry, it's going to get better. <laughs> so let's go on a journey to discover how this might connect with us. So Phyllis Trickle, in her book, The Great Emergence, has this great phrase where she says, once every 500 years, Jesus has a rummage sale with his church. He, he looks at the church and he says, oh, there's too much stuff that's built up in my church that no longer serves me, serves my purposes and what I created my church for. I'm going to have to throw a load of stuff out and then I'm going to have to lead the church back into the things that I created them for. And we see this in church history. The book tells more of that story. But 500 years ago, we had the Reformation. 500 years later today, I think we are in one of those rummage sale moments in the church. Where what has happened within our churches is a lot of stuff has built up over time that originally served the church. It's like the trellis that allows the plant to grow. It was really helpful in serving the church. But over time, it becomes the focus instead of the plant. And it builds up and it gets in the way of what God wants to do. And just like you might send some stuff off to eBay or, 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 to, or to the tip that used to be really useful to you, but is just cluttering up your home, I think God is doing something at the moment where he's saying, this stuff has got to change. It's no longer serving me. And just like he says to the Laodiceans, you might not have noticed this yet. But you've got to open your eyes, let my spirit put salve on your eyes and see afresh what I'm wanting to do in my church at this time. So if, 
this is the reason, then let me explain something of why I have a conviction about this being the place that we're in at the moment. So we're going to go on a journey from a place where I describe as being the collaborating majority. And this is Christendom. I'm sure you know this phrase. It was a phrase used in the ninth century in King Alfred's um, court. Uh, they were writing and describing and writing the history of, of, of England at that time. And they looked out across the, the nation and they said, this is a Christian nation now. Everybody has a chance to be part of a church. The church is leading the nation. People accept the, the Bible and the Christian values. And this person writing church history says, this is Christendom, Christ's kingdom here on earth. And the way, the way that was expressed was that there was a church in every community. And the church had a leading role. And it set political decisions as well as religious decisions. And the church ministered to people at every one of their points of life the, as they were born in baptism and in death and in marriage. And the priests and the pastors in the local community, church communities were the leaders of those communities. And communities were centered on the church. And ch the church built up a, a position of collaboration with our society. And it was really good because the, the goodness of God's word actually founded the, the, the laws of our nation. It brought goodness into people's lives in terms of, as we understand, how to live our lives from the basis of, of scriptural principles. So there's so much good in it. But the result of that was that a number of key things happened over hundreds and hundreds of years as we collaborated with society. And a number of things distorted within the Christian faith. And these are the things that I think that God wants to deal with as we um, address where we are as a church at the moment. And so in that passage we had read, it talks about you're blind and you need salve for your eyes. And in, in his book, Mere Discipleship, Lee Camp talked about the Christendom cataract. And it's a really evocative word because if you know about cataracts, they just begin to grow across the eye. And they grow slowly. And over time, you suddenly realize you can't see as you could before. And they bring blindness to the eye. And what happened in Christendom is that we became blind to the distortions that were happening in the church. The first one is that we had this relationship with the world. We had the relationship with the world where we made friendship with the world. And as I said, there was so much good that came from that as the church shaped our society. The problem was that as things began to change, particularly in the 18th century, Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution, that the more and more of society moved away from the ways of, of God and the church. But the church still tried to keep a friendship with the world. And so we, as the Church of England, are established as the national church. We, we have a position. Our bishops are in the House of Lords. We're the national church, and we expect to have a position of favor in our land. And yet we now are in a world that has rejected the church and the Christian faith, and we've lost the ability to be a prophetic voice that calls our society to repent because we've built up patterns of relationship with the world that say we're going to bless the world. We're going to love the world. We're going to be in friendship with the world. We're going to serve our communities. And as I said, so much of this is good, but what it has done is it's removed from our understanding as the church that we as a church are called to call our society to repentance, to call people to salvation, to be a prophetic word that reveals the ways of God in a way that is distinct from the ways of the world. And because we've lost this, we now find ourselves in a very difficult position that we'll talk about in a moment. So that's relationship with the world. The second one is this strange word, cessationism. Um, this is the, a, a shorthand phrase that describes how the church um, rejected the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so um, 
what happened was that in the experience of church, there wasn't very much um, experience of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. People weren't seeing people healed. They weren't hearing God speak to them. And so people began to say, oh, the, 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 the description in Acts and in other New Testament books, that was for the time of the Bible, the apostles' time. And when the Bible was written and the time of the apostles ended, we didn't need those gifts anymore, and so God took them away. Now, we now know, because of the charismatic renewal, that that's not true anymore. We know that God gives those gifts to his church. But what we need to understand is that for many centuries, the church existed with no understanding of the Holy Spirit, no understanding of the gifts of the Spirit. And it did so because it could actually function quite happily in our, in our nation without needing them to demonstrate God because we had that privileged position. Now, the, the result of that is, is for churches that are great like um, St. Andrew's, you have an openness to the Holy Spirit. But that distortion in our, in our perception is still there. And what it meant was that instead of depending on the Holy Spirit, as we see the early church did, we depended on ourselves. We, we had what somebody has described, and we developed the Western Industrial Church Complex. We began to build church. We began to manufacture church. We began to do church without the need for God turning up at all. Because actually, we, we, were, we became experts and professionals at just working just the, the week by week, year by year, maintaining the pattern of church that had been established. And this isn't just to do with traditional church and historic denominations and their liturgies and historic um, structures. This is in modern evangelicalism where we, we, we try to manufacture and build and we have strategic plans and we have things that will, uh, we think will actually achieve something for God and we live without a dependency on the Holy Spirit. And even for us in the charismatic churches, we have to recalibrate our understanding of our relationship with God and church so that instead of just allowing the Holy Spirit in at certain points, we become utterly dependent on him. That we look for his word over every part of our life. That we look for a sensitivity to his spirit in our, in our lives. We look for him to set the agenda. And we depend on his power as we go out in mission and his presence to touch people's lives. I really believe church looks very different when we depend on the Holy Spirit. And we've still got this cataract to overcome. And the last one is that we became a missionless church. Um, our, our society was seen as Christian, therefore we don't do any mission. And the church became absolutely devoid of missional practice. It just existed with a building in the middle of a community, a professional minister, a priest, a pastor, and we expected anyone who wanted to come to come. And anyone who didn't want to come, well, they probably still believed, and that was okay. I remember, um, even in the 1970s, a really funny story where my dad was a vicar, and, uh, and uh, he had to go and help out with a guy who got in trouble with the police. Because in the local pub, there was somebody who criticized the church my dad was leading, and the bin man who, d who collected our bins from our vicarage, he beat the guy up who, um, uh, who criticized the church. And my dad went and spoke to him, and he says, nobody's going to criticize my church. And my dad says, you never come. <laughs> and and it was, it's that kind of experience where a church is in a community. We are part of the church. Everybody's included in the church. Kids get christened and never come again. And we never do mission calling people to repentance. So if any of that rings true, then I want us to understand that that's the that's the place we've come from. And now I want us to talk about where we are today. So if we go on to the next slide. 
we have gone from a collaborating majority where our society wants us to be the leaders of our society, to be the center of every community, to bring the Christian faith into every part of uh, society, to a conflicted middle where our society has moved so far from those Christian values um, that it no longer wants us to bring them into every part of its life. And yet we are in between that society that has in in many ways rejected God and a God who is calling us to be a missionary disciple-making movement in our culture. And we're in the middle of that and we don't quite know how to, to work it out. And so if you're feeling, I don't quite know how to work this out at the moment, you're okay. Because that's where we are. That's the reality of where we are, friends. But the result is, is when we experience things like the issues over human sexuality, this is just a small um, sign, well, not necessarily a small one, but a, but a significant sign of this conflict that we're in in which society says, I no longer want what the church used to teach about this, and the church is struggling to know, how do I now be the church in this context? Am I meant to be friends with this world still? Or am I meant to be this prophetic community that calls for repentance and stands for the word of God? We're in the conflict in the middle. And genuinely, if you're feeling that conflict in any way, I again just want to affirm you, because it's not easy. But because we've been used to being friends with the world, we haven't realized that at times the gospel is a stumbling block. At times, standing for the truth of God causes people pain. And we haven't got used to that dynamic. We feel really terrible about the risk of standing for the Bible's teaching on sexuality and relationships. And the reason we find it so hard, it's not because it's the world, it's because it's our family and our friends and our work colleagues. And we're having to make a choice, friends, as to where we go from this place of conflict, where we feel the tension of this so much. And there's pressures to go two ways. And I want to present the choice that we have before us in this next slide. Oh, actually, sorry, I'll just, um, I'll just use the next slide to give you a quote. This conflict um, and temptation to compromise on what the, and to go where, where the world is going is summarized for me in this phrase from Richard Niebuhr, because... We're not in a place where we're just dealing with the issue of human sexuality. We're dealing with a reality that is trying to shape the church and redefine the church and and reinterpret scripture in a way that just isn't there. And so Richard Niebuhr describes it in this way, that we are in danger of agreeing to a Christian faith where there is a God without wrath who brought man without sin into a kingdom without judgment and the man, um, the minister, through the ministration of a Christ without a cross. Because all those things require repentance. All those things require an acknowledgement that the world's gone wrong. All those things require a, a reality that God in his holiness requires us to come to him through the cross. And there's no other way. But the world says to us, if you're going to love me, you have to affirm me. You have to just agree with me. You have to accept me and not in any way call me to change. And that's the tension that we're in. So where will we go from here? Will we go from being a collaborating majority to one of two places, a compromised mythology or a creative minority? The compromised mythology is this understanding that the world is, and the devil and the battle, the spiritual battle that we're in is exerting pressure on us as Christians to compromise the Bible, to compromise what the Bible teaches and instead to, to give up on some of it in order to be acceptable to the world. And, and there are really good people who are doing this within the church 
out of compassion for the world. So these aren't terrible people. They're not people who are going away from God and, and trying to teach something completely opposite. They're just like the Laodiceans. They're people who think, oh, I'm getting this right. But they're also like the Laodiceans, trying to mix the world with God and his word. And you end up with something completely lukewarm, which you've lost the call of the church. In this uh, compromised mythology, Jesus is no longer Lord. Our following of him is no longer about surrender and obedience and repentance uh, and allowing him to transform us. Instead, he becomes the patron saint of our religion. He's still there and we still worship him, but we deny his power and his right to call us to a life that is countercultural. And instead, we seek to continue in friendship with the world trying to win people and to keep them coming to church and trying to address the decline and trying to keep our place at the table and our influence in society. And it's tempting, friends. It really is deeply tempting. But the alternative is to be a creative minority. I love this phrase. It comes actually from outside the, the Christian faith. And the next slide gives a great description of this by uh, Jonathan Sachs. And so Jonathan Sachs, who, is the, who used to be the, uh, the rabbi uh, in the UK, says that to be a creative minority is not easy because it involves maintaining strong links with the outside world while staying true to your faith, seeking not merely to keep the sacred flame burning, but also to transform the larger society of which you are a part. This is a demanding and risk-laden choice. What he's saying there is that we don't distance ourselves from the world. We don't become a sect that's separate and hides away. But he says we will become a minority that seeks to engage with the world creatively, but in no way compromises on the beliefs of what we hold true to. And in that creative engagement and absolute conviction, we begin to see transformation. But the reason that the phrase is helpful for me is, is the word minority. We as Christians are going to have to realize we are a minority in this country. The latest census uh, has said that uh, we, are, we no longer have the majority of people counting themselves as Christians. They didn't anyway, but they used to tick that box in the census. We now have less than 50% of people ticking the box in the census. That they, are, that they are Christians. If you take that down into younger generations, it's, it's almost less than 1% or 2%. The Church of England has 0.5% of the 18 to 25-year-olds in, in the country. So that's why the band being under, in, in their 20s is so significant, honestly. It's great. Um, but that's the reality for the church in this nation. We're a minority. And my encouragement is that if we can come to a place where we acknowledge that we're in this place of minority, but we offer ourselves to Jesus Christ afresh, we say, Lord, yeah, we've got some stuff wrong, but we want to put ourselves in your hands, and we want to go on a journey in which we discover what it means to be the church again. And I'm excited, more excited than I've ever been, because these are the moments in church history where God takes hold of his church, where the church says, I've got nothing left to offer, Jesus. I can't do this anymore. I can't work it out myself. I give up trying to do it myself, and I just surrender to you. And then he says, great, I've got you where I wanted you, and I can take hold of you and start to do things that I couldn't do otherwise. I love this quote from um, somebody who witnessed the Welsh revival. He was reflecting on it on the basis of other past revivals, and he says this, It is ever the darkest hour before the dawn. The nation always seems to be given over to the evil one before the coming of the Son of Man. The decay of, uh, the, the decay of religious faith the deadness of the churches, the atheism of the well-to-do, the brutality of the masses, all these, when at their worst, herald the approach of the revival. Things seem to get too bad to last. 
The reign of evil becomes intolerable, and then the soul of the nation awakes. And 100,000 people were saved in a year in Wales. I think we're in that society now. I think we look around us and people are saying, this isn't working anymore. People are angry. They've, they've been sold a lie as if Western capitalism would be the dream. We're seeing the ongoing fight in, and war in the Ukraine, a war that's on our doorstep. I love the fact we prayed for Sudan today. But this has been something that's shaken us because it's just around the corner. And I think that there is an opportunity for God to revive his church, ready for a culture that says there's got to be more than this. But it takes a church that's willing to do what it says in this passage from Leo in Revelation 3, where Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Friends, just opening the door again, repenting and saying, Jesus, we need you. And then stepping forward into the things he needs to begin to teach us. And so he'll teach us about depending on the Holy Spirit. He'll teach us about making him Lord. He'll teach us about how to do mission in our culture. That's why I'm so excited about the missional community journey you've begun. It'll be a journey because we've got to learn things with Jesus together. But if we're willing to open the door again and say, Jesus, here I am, he will take us. And who knows what he might do with us if we're willing to humble ourselves and be that creative minority in his hands. Shall we stand together? I'm just going to start to lead some prayers and then... Um, Simon will come and, and lead us into the time of ministry. But Lord Jesus, help us this morning to see you again in your victory and your reign in heaven, in all of your glory. That Lord, as we come before you, there is no risk in trusting our whole selves to you. You are faithful and good. You have won for us an internal inheritance and in the time we have on earth, we're longing for you to use us, to bring you glory, to reveal you to others and to let your kingdom come. So Lord, would you hear us say again to you, here I am, Jesus. Send me, use me. And Lord, where we've got it wrong, where there's stuff that's built up that isn't of you, where we've inherited stuff from the past that we're wrestling with, would you help us? But Lord, we just surrender completely afresh to you and say, come Holy Spirit, come and take full reign and rule in our lives again. Come and lead us on from this place. That we might become more and more of the church that you're calling us to be. For your glory's sake. Amen.